When I hear from one, not one, not two of the women from Women Who Write that I've got to check somebody out, I usually don't listen. No, I, I do. I do. And I especially listen when I hear it from Lynn Stewart and Tracy Newman because they've never, ever let us wrong. So when they told me that I had to check out Steve Bluestein, I did. Um, okay. And, 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 and by the way, if we don't love him, we'll be leaving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know that you will. Okay. A comedian, Steve Bluestein, spent years pounding... Stein. 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 Oh, okay. Stein. Stein. Oh, oh. Stein. All right. See, now I'm fucking up all the names. <laughs> Tiff, you're not alone. Let's see what I can do to Eddie Pepitone later. Okay. So, Pepperstein. Um, uh, okay, he pounded the boards in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, Reno, Tahoe, and countless comedy clubs across the nation. Born in Boston, his heart was always in New York. New Yorkers, lots of New Yorkers here. Where he first went to Bud Friedman's Improv, oh yeah, and got bitten by the comedy bug. Moving to L.A., he immediately became one of comedy store, uh, one of the comedy store regulars and was a founding member of the Groundlings. Hello! We've had many of them here, Sandy and Tracy and Lynn. Okay, this is nepotism at its finest. <laughs> After writing for Norman Lear and Playboy, he joined the sitcom staff of 13 East on NBC, then went on to write Totally Hidden Video and The New Candid Camera. Um, Funt, yeah, we, we, we're friends with Funt on Facebook. Um, not content with simply writing for television, Steve has um, turned his talents to the theater. His first effort, the play Rest in Pieces, <laughs> was read and then optioned for Broadway. He then went on to pen five more stage plays, <coughs> Gary's Gold, Why Wendy, and The Vegetable. Steve has just published his first book, It's Hard to Type with a Gun in My Mouth. Quoting <laughs> from a review from Laughlin, Nevada, you simply got to see him, he's hysterical, and all I've got to say is, Prove it. Lay it. actually a three-part chapter in my book, and uh, it was too long, so I'm only going to do the second, the last two parts of the uh, book, but I'll give you the, the setup, which was I had done, I had been offered a TV show in New York City, and they offered me a limousine, and they offered me everything, and, and one of the things they offered me was round-trip tickets, first class, and I got triple miles, on it, <laughs> which was, and then when I got when I got to New York, they told me the show had been canceled, oh. and I knew I was going to be stranded, but they gave me a limo for the day, and I spent the whole day in New York, and I went to the theater, and I went home first class, and there was a limo at the airport in L.A., and it brought me home, and the check bounced in five minutes. Oh. <laughs> five minutes, and I, in the book, I said, being a Jew, I dropped my suitcase in the bedroom and ran to the bank, because I knew that the check was going to bounce, oh. but... I had gotten the triple miles, <laughs> which gave me enough miles to take a friend to Paris. Wow. And that's where we are. All right. So, okay. So I had given a, I had been given a three thousand dollar travel voucher from American Airlines, and was about to purchase a ticket to Paris for the dream trip of my life. Then I remembered I was agoraphobic. <laughs> I can't go to a country where I didn't speak the language. Who would feel my forehead when they see to see if I had a temperature? <laughs> How could I ask where su suicide prevention was? Who would cut my steak? <laughs> I, remem I remember that my neighbor, Bella, spoke French fluently. So I made her an offer. I'll buy you a ticket to Paris. You take care of the hotel. I had a travel companion, which made me sound like I was an elderly woman in a wheelchair. <laughs> and so on the day of the departure, it was very exciting. 
the dogs are in the kennel, the house sitter was in place, the phones were covered, the bills were all paid. Nothing was going to get in my way of having a good time. Nothing but my life. <laughs> then, in the cab, on the way to the airport, Bella says, shit. Me, what shit? What are you shitting about? We were six minutes into the trip. How could you already be shitting? <laughs> and she turns to me and she says, I forgot my luggage keys at home. Oh, no. Bella, how are we going to get through customs? To which Bella says, I speak French. I'll just explain to them what happened and we'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you. I now have my 13-hour flight obsession. Not being allowed into France for oh. lack of keys. <laughs> I get on the plane, and we have great seats, bulkhead, center, I'm on the aisle. Across the aisle from me is a dark woman with a mustache. <laughs> I smile, she smiles. I stop smiling, she doesn't stop smiling. And she smiles, 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 and she smiles. And she smiles. And she smiles, and she smiles. <laughs> Out of the corner of my mouth, I say to Bella, Upne on the aisle. <laughs> we take off, and Mona Lisa is still smiling <laughs> and staring at me. They serve drinks. She still smiles. <laughs> I'm like so uncomfortable, I want to pluck off my eyebrows. <laughs> Bella has a wonderful sense of humor and loves torturing me, so she reaches over me and says to the dream girl, first time going to Paris? To which Miss Toothpaste replies, I first go first time, me see, me see. Now this opens up the door to a wide area of conversation with Rain Woman. You see book on table. I run with book. Come look at book. Me like book. Book look good. And other unnatural phrases she's learned at Berlin. Bella is wetting herself. She is laughing so hard. I'm on the aisle and must contain, maintain my composure. However, it's not working. The more Gunga Din talks, the harder it is for him to keep a straight face. Now I start laughing, and Miss Malaprop, and Miss Malaprop starts laughing. And that's how we spent the first six hours of the plane, laughing with Miss Goodbar. Finally, finally, the movie starts, and I'm saved. We land, and then I remember about Bella and the keys. She's fine with it. And she approaches immigration, bonjour, and lots of other French words I didn't understand. She's very composed and very positive. The agent is not. I see her take her into a room, and then her luggage follows. She turns to me and says, they're going to open my luggage. The immigration guy looks at me and says, are you with her? I nod, and I'm in a private room. A room in which they are removing every single thing from my suitcase, including the toothpaste, which they prod, which they prod in, and my pills, which I explain. Uh, this one is for anxiety. This one is to sleep. This one's for the anxiety when I can't sleep. This one is to bite in case I'm captured behind enemy lines. <laughs> No laugh. I need a pill. They take out every piece of clothing I have packed and shake it, tap it, and put it down. And when they're finished with the packed clothes, they start on the ones I'm wearing. I am strip searched and given a prostate exam, if you get my drift. The ordeal lasts about an hour and I'm cleared. It appears... I look like some terrorists. <laughs> Me? So I meet Bella in the waiting room, and I, see, and I see her luggage has been pried open, and all her stuff is in plastic bags. She looks at me and says, there's no truth that the French are not friendly. <laughs> Look how they repacked everything. <laughs> I'm, not, 
not in a good mood. I've been in the country 10 minutes and I've already been prison raped. <laughs> and without dinner and a movie. So we gather up what's left of our belongings and we head to the hotel. We walk in with shopping bags and suitcases wrapped in masking tape and our hair's all a mess and I can't sit. <laughs> Bella gives the desk clerk our names. He looks up the file and he says, uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> Your room are not ready. Tick, tick, tick. <laughs> when will they be ready? I growl. And he says, 13 hours. <laughs> 13 hours? Bella says, Calm down. Let's go out and get something to eat. They'll hold our bags, uh, luggage, uh, garbage. <laughs> I've wanted to go to Paris all my life, but so far it's not been what the brochure said it would be. The hotel clerk takes our crap and we go out for pizza. We're in the gourmet capital of the world and she takes me to Shakey's. <laughs> I'm really, really depressed at this point. Bella can see I'm not happy, and she pays for the pizza. Not spending money always makes me happy. The pizza comes, and we begin to dine. Bella is up, and she's happy, and she's telling me all about what we're going to see this week, and I take the first bite of the pizza, and I'm chewing. And Bella notices an expression on my face and says, What's wrong? And as calmly as I can, I tell her, I have just swallowed a $1,600 gold and porcelain crown. And I open my mouth, and there is a gap in the front of my smile. She starts laughing hysterically. And says, don't worry, what goes in must come out. And that was the understatement of the trip. For the very next day in my Paris hotel room, I'm on a treasure hunt. <laughs> and that's when the fun really begins. This is part three now. So I ate the pizza and swallowed my crown. Bella said not to worry, it would come out the next day and I could save it. And, and I believed her. My first, my first mistake. The day after the pizza, the pizza feast, I get up to do my morning rituals. I tell best Bella I'm going to the bathroom, and she says, you'll need to find something to find your tooth. She goes to the room cart and hands me a surgical equipment, a plate, and a fork. <laughs> I head into the bathroom, and she heads down to the lobby, because we're going to Versailles. She needs directions. Now, in the French bathrooms, there, are, there is a toilet, and next to it is a bidet, a, a fixture similar in design to a toilet that's, that one straddles to clean their butts. The French are so piss-elegant, aren't they? My ritual is done, and I get everything on the plate. <laughs> I'm a shit wrangler. <laughs> then I start the task of probing. It's like looking for a body in an avalanche, if you know what I mean. I sit on the, the bidet and I'm deep in my work. I cannot believe, believe I'm doing this. Who would believe it? This is not what I came to Paris for. <laughs> so anyway, did you ever get so deep into your work that all your surroundings suddenly cease to exist? That's how I was on the $1,600 treasure hunt. I was working in complete concentration. Then, for no reason, I look up. And much to my chagrin, the maid is standing. <laughs> Ashen. Monsieur, no! She runs out of the room, and I am now known by the hotel staff as the American shit eater. <laughs> Bella comes back to the room and says to me, What did you do to the maid? I just passed her in the hall, she 
was crying. <laughs> and I tell her what happened. And Bella starts on the laughing track that lasts 15 minutes. Every time she composes herself, she looks at me and she starts laughing at me. She says, don't worry, you'll find it tomorrow. And she says that as she wipes away a tear. She says, do you want me to wash your plate? And she starts laughing again. So we take the train to Versailles, and Bella is still giggling. Versailles is magnificent. She looks, looks a lot like my aunt's house in Long Island, <laughs> only it's got less gold. We're, we're enjoying the gardens, and when Bella says, when I say to Bella, I, I have to go to the bathroom oh, again, no. and she says, I'll get you a plate and a fork. <laughs> I, go, I go once a day like clockwork, so I'm sure the second time, the tooth is eating its way up. <laughs> I, I get into the men's room, but in France, there's a woman that sits in the men's room as you walk in. She says in broken English, uh, Monsieur, I will take your plate. <laughs> and I shake my head and say, no, I need it. I'm in the stall, and I see two sets of feet outside the door. There's a tapping at the door. Monsieur, would you come out, monsieur, s'il vous plaît? We would like to speak with you. And now I'm trying to explain to the police why I need a plate and a fork in the toilet. They're not buying it, and we're thrown out of Versailles. Bella is absolutely in her glory. She said to me, oh God, I wish you had found it at Versailles. It's the perfect place to find a crown. And she is screaming with laughter. Meanwhile, I look like Aretha Franklin with a huge gap in my mouth. Okay, so this goes on for the rest of the week. Plate, bidet, fork. Plate, bidet, fork. Nothing. No tooth. Now I'm sure it's hooked itself inside something on my intestine, and it's going to cause some kind of abscess that will explode, and I'll die in Paris. I'll need a colostomy bag, and I'll never be able to wear shorts again. It's really been a fantastic trip. We arrive back in L.A., I call my dentist for an emergency session. She makes a temp for me because the next day I open in Vegas. I was opening for Donna Summer in Vegas. I figure I'll make one last ditch effort to find the tooth. I take a triple dose of x -Lax. I am determined to get this tooth out of me. Next morning, it's like my intestines passed away. <laughs> Nothing, not even gas. I chalk it up to eight-year-old x lax <laughs> You're ahead of me. I'm on the plane. We're taxiing down the runway. We're at 350 miles an hour, and the nose is just lifted off when all of a sudden my asshole explodes. I have never had to go to the bathroom so badly in my life. The seatbelt sign is on, and I'm sitting there, and I said to her, if I don't get to the bathroom now, they're going to have to repaint the cab. <laughs> is an ascent. It's at a 45 degree angle. And I'm pulling my way up the aisle. The flight
flight attendants, all of them, start screaming, Get back to your seat! The seatbelt light is on! To which I reply, If I don't get into the toilet now, we're getting to Vegas 20 minutes early. I make it to the bathroom. I make it into the bathroom. Yeah, this was long before 911. Today, I would probably have been shot on the plane. <laughs> and lo and behold, I go to the bathroom, and lo and behold, there is the tooth. Oh no! And I reach down to get it. Oh, oh, no. And the plane hits a pocket. Oh. The flap falls oh. out, and the tooth drops down oh. into the oh. into the tank. Now I'm in the bathroom and I'm screaming profanity like a chick. God damn son of a bitch! There's a knock on the door. It's the captain. I'm in deep shit, literally. He sits me down and explains why I have to sit in my seat or will be arrested when we arrive in Vegas. I tell him the tooth story starting with the maid. Get back to your seat, is all he said. Now there's a postscript. When I get back to the dentist and I tell her what happened, she said to me, Steve, if you actually got it, would you want me to put it back in your mouth? <laughs>